What does it mean to be alive? What does it mean to be human? It's a hell of a topic for a video. It's also a hell of a topic for a game too. But I want you to think about that for a moment. What is the difference between a human and a robot? Is it the body, the voice, if it even has one, or both? If someone sounds human, and you believe they're human, are they actually human? Could they just be a robot? Does it even matter to you if they are? What about being alive? Most people draw the line at the heartbeat. If the heart beats, we're alive. If it doesn't, we're dead. Simple. Well, not quite. What about life support? A variety of medical procedures that are designed to keep someone alive. If the thing they're being kept alive by is making their heart beat, then by definition, they are alive. But what is the definition of being alive? Now, philosophy is known to make very straightforward questions more complicated than they seem, but I do want you to think about this going forward, as Soma was created to chip away at these ideas and make you question everything about them. Soma is a game about the horrors of transhumanism, existentialism, and what it means to be human. I want to issue a spoiler warning, because Soma is a different game. Soma's gameplay is based around walking, running, and hiding. There's no weapons, abilities, skill trees, or side quests. It's one of those games that you buy for the story, and by discussing that story in its entirety, I will have ruined any reason for you to buy it. So if anything so far from the visuals to the commentary sounds interesting to you, then I recommend you buy the game, play it, and come back. I can wait. For those of you that want to continue though, let's get started. Soma starts with a brief dream of our protagonist Simon. He's talking with a girl named Ashley before noticing that he is bleeding, to which he wakes up soon after. This reoccurring dream that he's having is tied to his phone call. This phone calls from a Dr. Munchi, who wants Simon to come in for a brain scan. Once Simon hangs up, we're free to explore his room and uncover the real truth. One day in April of 2015, Simon and Ashley were driving when a distracted driver ran a red light and hit their car. Ashley died right away, but Simon had permanent brain damage. Simon is now going to see Dr. Munchi for a brain scan with the hope that it will save his life, as without his help, he has months at best. One thing you'll notice right away is how detailed Simon's room is and how interactive the environment is. Soma is one of those games where you can pretty much pick up anything you want. The objective for now though is to find the bottle the doctor gave him, drink it, then go to the office. But there is no time limit. Time has essentially stopped, giving us the chance to look at everything we want. This intro is very reminiscent of Prey's intro and both serve the same purpose. They not only give the player a chance to test settings and make sure the controls feel alright, but once you actually start looking around, you'll get a glimpse of what the person's life is like. Simon at this moment is just a guy who almost died in a car accident, but Simon is also a photographer and an employee at a bookstore. Judging from the posters in his room, he seems to enjoy music festivals, has an appreciation for art, and might even be into space. But not everything is going to come with a positive outlook. There is trash left on tables and chairs. His fridge is filled with TV dinners and fast food. There are various pizza boxes taking up space around the apartment. There's a plant that seems to have withered away a bit, and he still has the torn newspaper article reporting on the crash. All these environmental details provide knowledge to the player about who Simon is. It's only been a few minutes and already we feel connected to our character, and if anything, we should be. He's our protagonist after all, so we should probably get to know him first before we set off on our journey together. Simon then takes the tracer fluid and sets off to Dr. Munchi's office, although I use office loosely as just like his work, it's still in its infancy. Dr. Munchi isn't just some normal doctor, and this isn't just a normal appointment. So, what exactly are we doing? We're gonna do a scan of your brain. Then we build a computer model of it and bombard it with stimuli. The program will help us to quickly iterate your treatment plan until it's fully optimized. In short, develop the perfect treatment for your condition. The treatment is called a neurograph, and it's still very much in its early stages, but at this point, what does Simon have to lose? If he fails, oh well, he was dead anyway. But if it succeeds, not only is this a breakthrough for modern medicine, but Simon could actually live. So Simon sits in the seat and begins the examination. Much as getting your picture taken. Indians thought cameras would steal their souls. That's so. Well, let's hope they're wrong. <laughs> Ready? Say cheese. What happened? Mr. Munchie? Did something go wrong? Simon is... somewhere. This reveal works in two ways, both of which lead to the same result. As a player, you either think that Simon was teleported to a whole new location, or this is just one of the many simulations that Dr. Munchie was going to be doing. The latter is incorrect, but it's still an acceptable theory. Simon is currently in a facility called Pathos 2, but there are a lot more things going on than just a change in scenery. 
Simon cannot only listen to these devices without touching them, but the facility is underwater. Oh, and yeah, it's also 2104, so Simon is now 90 or so years in the future. To make matters worse, this is a horror game, after all. So we aren't the only beings here. But if I'm being honest, Soma's story is a lot scarier than its gameplay. A horror game like Outlast is a nice comparison. Outlast is a scary game, but its story really isn't. Yeah, the main character is stuck in an asylum, but it's just the character, not us the player. Soma's story transcends the limits of the game world. Half the time it felt like the dialogue was supposed to be for me and not Simon. Sometimes Simon would even just talk to himself about his current predicament, and I couldn't help but feel like he was talking to me. The game's story is scary, but in a way that gets the player scared as well. For example, here's Simon's first interaction with Life on Pathos 2. Hey, can you hear me? was that. So much happened in just a short amount of time, I don't even know where to begin. Firstly, we have a talking robot that is showing clear signs of sentience, which is already weird enough, but it was also connected to the control panel with these black tendrils that acted as a sort of life force for it. Soma, however, knows how to balance its scary with its soothing elements, as right after turning on the power, Simon will get a call from a woman named Catherine. She's the first person that Simon has been able to talk to, which gives him a large degree of hope that he isn't alone. She also gives us and Simon our first objective, find the comm center and call her. The player then has to go down another floor to cross the room, but the game feels that now would be a suitable time for some actual gameplay. This is our first horror sequence, and like many games that have no offensive capabilities, the idea is the same, hide and don't get caught. It's not a difficult sequence by any means, in fact I would say Soma isn't really all that difficult at all. I never died once during my entire playthrough. This is because Soma has a mechanic that allows you to take another hit before you die, so while I was caught a few times, I never actually failed. Except this one time a bit later when an anglerfish was chasing me, which kind of makes me a little sad when I think about it, as out of all the robotic and flesh-eating monsters this game has, an anglerfish was the one thing that almost did me in. But in a bizarre twist that I never saw coming, Soma has a second difficulty called Safe Mode. It eliminates a lot of the horror from this game, as enemies cannot kill you unlike a normal mode. So Soma is already cutting away even more content from an already cut game. Soma has no engaging gameplay in the traditional sense, so all that's left is horror and story. But now the horror is gone, so all there is is just the story. But how can you make a horror game without the horror? While well, the tension and stress are still present even in safe mode, but this mode allows the player to focus less on the horror and more on the story, and as I said, many have argued that Soma's story is scarier than the actual horror itself. I played this game on normal for the first time since I figured the game would lose its appeal if I played it the other way, but there was one detail about this that I had naively overlooked. From a more general perspective, this is really convenient for those who have anxiety when it comes to stressful situations, so it's an accessibility tool, but it also doubles as a story mode. The one thing I hate about not just Soma, but games like it, are those specific horror sequences. You know the ones I'm talking about, when you're in a room filled with lore and info, but because there's an unkillable enemy in the same room, you can't find the time to actually explore the area and learn the story, because you end up becoming more focused on the gameplay rather than the story. Well, with safe mode, I was able to explore the areas to my heart's content, and wouldn't you believe it, I discovered things I didn't find my first time through. Furthermore, thanks to another setting that removes the visual distortion when an enemy is nearby, we can actually see the creatures that we were too busy running away from. Honestly, playing around in this mode made me realize how much of a net positive this ends up becoming for everybody. Now, should every horror game include something like this? Probably not, but I can think of a few games that would definitely benefit from it. Using safe mode, we can get a better look at the enemy in front of us. It doesn't provide us with much info, but we can see it's an amalgamation of tech and flesh. This creature looks similar to the robot we met earlier, but this one is actually mobile this time. Once you outmaneuver the robot, we can meet with another one of those sentient robots from earlier, but this interaction is even more concerning. What the hell happened to you? What are you? Are you blind? It's me, Carl. 
Carl Semke. Wrangler? Any of this sound familiar to you? I... no, actually. Well, thanks for being so helpful. It's not like I'm knocked out on the floor or anything. Are you... human? Shit. Did, did my body give it away? I try hard saying a mystery. Yeah, I'm human. Are you? Now things are becoming more confusing. This robot here named Carl seems convinced that he is human, but we can clearly see this isn't the case. But he doesn't seem to be joking though. He was a bit sarcastic, but who wouldn't be in this situation? If someone walked up to you and asked if you were human, wouldn't you think they're crazy? Now a question has settled in. Is Carl telling the truth? Or is he delusional? At the moment, it seems like it can go either way, but this ends up tipping towards delusional, as Carl the guy the robot claims to be is actually dead down the hall. So, how can Carl be dead, but also be this robot? It just doesn't make any sense. So, clearly this is just some sort of AI or sentient machine that is mimicking Carl, but that doesn't explain how it was able to converse with us so fluently. The decision to place a robot Carl in the same room as human Carl was a genius choice, as it forces the player to confront what's going on. It's not like earlier when the robot was just a thing that existed, there is clearly a person named Carl and a robot who believes he's Carl. At the very least, we can assume that this thing's brain is playing tricks on him. But he's not the only character in this game whose brain is tricking them. Only robots, crazy ones. Except for one. I think he said his name was Carl. He was okay, but I'm... I'm pretty sure I accidentally killed him by turning off the power. Oh. Well, you know, robots don't feel anything, so... Yeah. What was that? No! What's going on? I think this place is about to collapse. What do I do? What should I do? Oh, fuck. The brain is a very odd organ. It has the ability to store decades of memories and information, but it also just removes things when it deems it necessary. This same thing is happening to Simon. His brain is not recognizing parts of him that exist. From Simon's perspective, he sat in a chair and woke up in an underwater facility. His brain was so confused by the change in scenery that it couldn't even see that his body had changed. Simon assumed that he was just wearing the same clothes as before, but it was only until his brain was confronted with the truth that it needed to recognize the truth. Simon's brain removed this from its memory and its vision because if it wouldn't have, he would have likely gone insane. So it removed these parts of its memory until it couldn't any longer and it had to come to terms with the fact that Simon was breathing underwater. Had this not occurred at all, Simon would still believe he was in regular civilian clothing, as he had not been put in a situation where his mind needed to be questioned. This also relates back to Carl. His brain sees a humanoid body, two arms, two legs, and all the other parts in between, but we see the real Carl. His brain is sectioning that part of his existence away because if the truth was revealed to him, Carl would likely go insane. He said his last memory was him piloting a robot, and then the next thing he knows he was knocked out underneath some wiring. Both Simon and Carl have this gap in their memory, which is why their brain acts like everything was as it was before, despite that not being the case. It was also mentioned in this conversation that the power switch Simon flipped, which is something we did a bit earlier, killed Carl, but Catherine says it's no big deal, he was just a robot. But was he though? The robot trying to kill us earlier was a robot, but is he just as similar as Carl? Is Carl really a robot? Before the room flooded though, we got our last bit of information that creates the mold of this story. In 2103, about a year or so before Simon arrived here in Pathos 2, a comet hit the earth and killed everyone on the surface. The only humans left on the planet that we know of are the crew of Pathos 2. Because they were below sea level, the impact didn't affect them, but given how little personnel exists down here, the human race is officially doomed. There's no way to repopulate, and even if they all agreed to do so, the Earth is still on fire, so nowhere except Pathos 2 is habitable. Hell, not even this place is in stable condition. As for why Simon got sent down here, we'll have to come back to this later, but this reveal once again reinforces a lot of emotions that we've felt up until now. Talking with Catherine felt comforting because she was the only human we've been able to chat with here in Pathos 2, but since no one is left, she might just not be the only human in Pathos 2, but the only human in the world. 
As humans, we desire human connection. Some people need it more than others, but being alone for extended periods of time can create a problem for a person mentally. Even if you don't leave your house that much, you can still talk with those who live with you. Or at the very least, you can text someone or maybe chat online through Discord or something. But for Simon, none of that is possible. He might truly be alone in this world. And knowing that no one is alive makes him feel even lonelier than before, which is why Catherine is such a beacon of light for Simon and the player. But to get to her though, Simon will have to navigate the ocean floor. Now, I don't have a fear of water, but I'd be lying if I said looking down towards the bottom of the ocean doesn't at least make me uncomfortable. I can't imagine how it would feel to be this far down only with your thoughts. But once again, the team behind Soma knows this and decides to give the player a little robot helper. He doesn't speak and it won't interact with us, but its presence is just comforting. Yeah, it's a robot and not a human, but it's not trying to kill us, which is a first. Plus, it's kind of cute. It's a little round robot that beeps when it opens doors. What's not to love about it? Simon will eventually make it to a shuttle station that can take him right to Lambda, where Catherine is located. But the power is out and this brings us to one of the many choices in Soma. Hey, are you- Don't hurt me! Remember when I talked about life support, and if that means that we're alive? How about now? Does Amy look alive to you? In a literal sense, yeah, but she's being kept alive by wires and, in her case, is not allowed to die. Amy's also not as lucky as others hooked up to a ventilator. Turning off her power will likely be painful to her, but at least it's quick. But, should you kill her is the real question. She instructs us to find someone that can help her, but will we even find them? We're never going to come back to this location again, so this is our only chance to make a decision using the limited knowledge we have of the situation. Should you grant her death because no one deserves to go on like this, or should you let her be as there might be still hope that she can make it? It's the same predicament family members may have to go through when a loved one is in a coma or on life support. Should we end their life and stop their suffering, or should we just keep going just a little longer? It's a tough question, and one I hope I never have to answer. The shuttle Simon gets on is about to crash, but in a moment before that happens, we can watch a presentation of Pathos 2 that gives us a bit of the history of the facility. Around 2060, the facility was built as a thermal mining facility, but now it's become the home to the Omega Space Gun, which is used to shoot satellites and probes into space. Simon will eventually make it to the building Catherine is in, but is jumped by this... thing. It's got the same color palette as the previous robot we saw earlier, but this one is more agile and looks different. So it seems like these enemies are one and the same, but we still don't understand how or why they were created. This also highlights something rather interesting about Soma. It's a small detail, but when attacked, Simon will limp, and you can see the camera bob with his movement, which I thought was a nice touch. This also is not a one-time thing, for this event happens anytime Simon is attacked. The problem though is that the bobbing and visual effects could give you a headache after a while. Thankfully there are healing stations across the facility, but it's that black goo that we've been seeing everywhere. After escaping its grasp, we can lock the door behind us and finally get to meet Catherine. There you are, upright and everything. No, not you too. I was really hoping you were human. Don't let the circuitry fool you, I was human once. Can't take any more, this is... everything's fucked. I give up, there's nothing left. Calm down, it's not the end of the world. You sure? It sure as hell looks like it. For all I know, there's no one left except for me. What do you mean? I'm right here. Don't take this the wrong way, but I meant any humans left except for me. Have you looked at yourself lately? You're a walking, talking diving suit with some electronics left on for good measure. I... I don't... You don't want to think about it? We'll start thinking about it. I... I, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to be this. I want out. So, Catherine and Simon are robots. I didn't believe the first robot or Carl were human, but I believe that Catherine was, because she had a picture of herself. She's technically the first human thing we met. I saw her face in the comm center, and that was more than enough to convince me that she was human. My brain didn't even question whether what I was thinking was even true, I just went with it. It's kind of impressive how just a simple picture tricked me into thinking that the person I was talking to was different from everyone else I had met up until this point. Catherine wants us to take out her Cortex chip and put in the Omni tool that we found earlier on Pathos 2. This gives us a chance to take her with us on our adventure and also gives her a chance to explain what's going on. While most of the details are still unknown, we are given our next and final objective. After the comet hit the planet and killed everyone, Pathos 2 went on as normal, but obviously their work was irrelevant in the grand scheme of things. It was mostly just to stay sane and keep busy. Catherine, however, had a project she was working on. It was something called the Ark. It's a digital space that allows these copies of people she has to live on in a virtual world. It was a cool idea at first, but since the end of the world came and went, it became a bit more important. These digital copies she has are brain scans. We'll eventually learn this a lot later in a future area, but after some time Dr. Munchi continued with the brain scan science and it became incredibly successful. While his original idea of using it to help patients didn't work, it did become quite popular in the fields of AI. 
Since Simon was one of the first people involved in these brain scans, his scan lived on as a legacy scan, one of the original works of brain scanning. Pathos 2 has similar chairs to Dr. Munchi, which they call pilot seats, and since they have the legacy scan of Simon, that's why he suddenly was revived 100 years in the future. In that same area, we can listen to a few audio recordings dated back as far as 2015. Apparently, Simon was actually just scanned like normal and carried on with his entire day, but the scan ended up not working. Simon would eventually pass away a month later, but before dying, Dr. Munchi asked if he could use his brain scan for future work, which Simon agreed to. That's why Simon's brain scan is still accessible, and since Pathos 2 has some pilot seats and artificial intelligence, which I'll get to later, it explains why Pathos 2 has these scans specifically. As for why Simon doesn't remember the day he died, well, it's actually quite simple. It's like reverting a previous save. His save point was when he got the brain scan, then he carried on until he died without getting another save, so technically his last save was the day he went to Munchi's office. That's why the intro makes it seem like Simon went from one place to another instantly. Catherine is also just a brain scan, just a previous version of Catherine, or if we're to use the same example, a previous save of Catherine. What's unclear though is if her real self is still alive. When Simon goes across the hall, he discovers a few details about the Ark, a survey, the location of the Ark, and a few interviews. There are only three interviews that we can access, Robin, Ian, and Mark. All of them seem to be very enthusiastic about the Ark, but Mark's reaction is a bit different. He says that the Ark can help the human race go through the reality of continuity. Keep all these people in mind, as this will be relevant later. Within these files is also some pictures of the Ark, and we can see what it looks like inside, and it does seem like this perfect ideal world. Before we leave though, we can also take a survey that people aboard the Ark will have to take once they arrive. Just like the characters though, I'll bring up the significance of this later. After using the scanner, we discover that the Ark is still on Pathos 2, which Catherine is very displeased about. The plan was to launch it into space, so the Ark could last thousands of years, as right now it's only going to last a few decades. As for why the Ark didn't actually make it into space, once again, it'll be relevant later. But now we have our final objective, take Catherine to the Ark and launch it. This could sound a bit confusing since the world is gone, but that's the point. What else are you gonna do, sulk around and feel sad? Why not do some good before you pass on, even if it really won't matter anyway since the world is gone and the human race will be extinct. More than that though, Simon also thinks that if they can get the Ark and get a brain scan of each other, they can live inside the Ark like all the people are living in it right now. To get to the Ark though, we're gonna need a couple items. A power suit and a vehicle called the Dunbat. On the map are two locations called Tau and Phi. Both of them are thousands of meters deeper in the ocean than we already are, and due to the immense pressure buildup that occurs around that level, the Dunbat and the Power Suit are the only way to make sure that we won't go down there without dying to the pressure. Theta is the closest location to them, and it's also where the Dunbat is conveniently located. On the way there, the two run into more of that black goo, and Catherine says it belongs to the WoW. The WoW is the AI of Pathos 2. There's a lot of information about the WoW, so allow me to summarize it for you. As I said, the WoW is an AI. It's located in a place called Alpha Site. It's still within the grounds of the facility, but only three crew members actually know of its location. The WoW was held in this sphere at one point and was injected with that black goo. That goo is called Structure Gel. Structure Gel has some interesting properties to it, as it can repair both organic and synthetic material. You can use it as a replacement for thermal paste when using a computer chip, and the structure gel is what keeps people alive. It used to be used as a way to patch up holes around the facility that the WoW would take care of, but after the comet hit, its directive changed. Its main goal was no longer to keep the systems up and running within Pathos 2, but to preserve human life. However, the WoW is an AI, not a human, so it doesn't understand the nuances of being alive. Amy and Carl are victims of the WoW. As we know, Carl was killed, but since Catherine had his brain scanned for the Ark, the WoW used it and put him into a robot since it believed that it was saving him. It's also how Simon managed to get into the diving suit body that he's currently in. The WoW also ended up creating the various enemies that attack Simon throughout the facility. Each one though seems to have a different reason for attacking. That robot in the beginning just seems to be hostile to anything, but this other creature we met only attacked Catherine when she was using the building systems and is now attacking Simon when he tries to release the brake hatches on a nearby boat. It seems like the WoW is creating a defensive army to protect himself, which will make more sense once we get deeper into the facility. It is also entirely possible that it just tried to create things to preserve human life, but they had negative effects that the WoW had not anticipated, because some of the details about some of these enemies say that the electrical currents that they have is what is killing Simon, not the fact that they're trying to kill him intentionally, it's just a byproduct of them getting close to him. The two then manage to get to Theta, but are stuck. To continue, Simon needs another Cortex chip located in another robot. But the only two near us are the helper bot we found earlier and another rambling machine similar to Carl. We have to zap one of them until they stop moving, so we can take the chip. This is yet again another choice for the player. Do we destroy the helper bot or the robot? I mean, they're both robots. It shouldn't matter. But one is talking and the other isn't. And the bigger robot is someone like Carl, a person who thinks they're human but is stuck in a simulation thanks to their brain. Regardless of who you choose, you can then take the Cortex chip to Catherine and then go to Theta. 
On the way there, the two end up talking quite a bit about Simon's current condition, now that he has the time to really think it through. Even though Simon has accepted he is a robot, he's surprisingly unfazed for the most part. For as much as Simon's brain wants to kill him, thanks to the car crash, it's also incredibly resilient. It knows it's a robot, but instead of freaking out, it has come to terms with its new environment. I think one reason his brain hasn't imploded yet over this discovery is the fact that Simon is still humanoid. Carl was not even close to human, but Simon at least looks humanoid, which is something the mind is familiar with, so despite the change, it still feels comfortable. Near the entrance to Theta is another robot. This is Robin, the same one from the interview. Hello? Who is that? Mark? No, we haven't met before. Is this Mark? I think we're safe. Oh, I was so worried something had gone wrong. What's your name? Robin Bass. Theta Field Service Technician. Nice to meet you, Robin. How did you get here? I got scanned, like the others. And then I killed myself. At least I think so. I can't remember that part. How does that work? Did dying get you into the Ark? Wow, you're definitely not from Theta. Let me guess, Omicron? Wasn't sure Catherine would be able to scan you guys. You're lucky. There was a lot of talk about this at Theta. The idea is, when you're activated in the Ark, there's basically two of you, right? One human, one living skin in the Ark. You don't want your copy to survive you. You yourself want to survive on the Ark. If the human you dies before the scan is initiated, or closely after, you yourself would live on in the Ark. Amazing, right? Just like many of the characters we have met before her, you can choose to kill her or not. I want to brush past that though, as what she said is extremely important. If you remember from the interview, the third person was a Mark Sarang. Out of all the interviews, he had the oddest one. Whereas the other two were talking about the Ark and their thoughts on it, Mark went on this rant about the continuity of consciousness. Mark's theory is exactly what Robin said. If you kill yourself during the scan or right after, then the copied you won't be on the Ark, but the real you will be there instead. The brain scans and how they work are incredibly important. The brain scans copy the person, not transfer them. If we use Simon as an example, the original Simon, known as Simon 1, was the one in Toronto getting the brain scan. The Simon on Pathos 2, the one we now play as, is Simon 2. Simon wasn't transferred from one body to the next, he was copied into another body, so there would be two Simons at this point if he wasn't copied 90 years later. This causes a lot of problems for Catherine, as people were constantly killing themselves because they thought their copy would replace them on the Ark. Oddly enough though, they were actually correct. The copy version will replace the original on the Ark, but they believe that there was a way to prevent this. There isn't, because the brain isn't transferring you, it's copying you. I've seen a lot of discourse over this continuity theory. Some love it and others find it idiotic. I think it's incredible, because it's a normal human reaction. Mark and the crew that followed this continuity theory were wrong. This continuity thing doesn't exist, and that's never how it worked in the first place. But the actions that resulted from this theory are believable and human. All of these people are humanity's last hope, and none of them want to be down here. They want to be on the Ark. So if there's a chance to be on the Ark, then they'll take it. They're desperate for a better life because the one they live in currently sucks. And if they have to kill themselves to do it, then they will. Because what's the alternative? They're gonna die anyway. But anyone who doesn't follow through with the suicide might lose their seat on the Ark. So depending on what you choose, you either have much to gain and nothing to lose, or nothing to gain and much to lose. That's why I love this theory. It's still incorrect, but the reasons behind their actions make sense. Why not give it a shot? What's the worst that could happen? You're wrong and you die? Oh well, the entire world is gone, it's not like you're going to be missing much. This facility is where the Dunbat is located, but the Dunbat is under quarantine. To remove it, we need a security cipher, but only certain personnel have the new code, and this leads to one of the most concerning scenes in this whole game. To get the cipher, we need to find a security guard that was stationed here at Pathos 2, but since most people are dead, we can't do that. However, Catherine has brain scans of some of the crew, and one of them, Brandon Wan, just happens to be one of the crew members who would know the code. So we have to load Brandon's scan into the computer and get him to give it to us. This might seem a little odd, but nothing incredibly out of the ordinary, until you look at it from a different perspective. Brandon waking up in this simulation is the same way that Simon woke up in Pathos 2. This technically isn't a simulation, this is a real person. We're resurrecting a person so we can get info from them. Brandon is smart though, and manages to see through Catherine's trick. The simulation though has a backup procedure for this, which is that it shuts down the simulation whenever the person's stress level is too high to prevent them from going insane. If we fail, we can just give it another try and hope it works. No big deal. But once again, we're reviving a person back to life. So if we keep failing, we're basically killing 
and reviving Brandon as many times as it takes. What's even worse is that Simon and Catherine end up invading his room to find out more about him so that they can impersonate his girlfriends that he feels comfortable in the simulation. That is incredibly fucked up. And this is just one person who knows how many people Catherine could have done this to. Furthermore, we also have to consider Simon. He was a legacy scan for close to 90 years, and at the time, the tech was not perfect, so they likely used Simon as a test dummy to correct the tech, the same way we're torturing Brandon to give us the code. Now, Brandon obviously doesn't know he's dying constantly, but it doesn't make the situation any better. As for Simon, who knows how many Simons have gone through the same thing as Brandon, just to make sure the tech is still working. It's horrifying and downright inhumane, and this whole scene makes you feel like a complete piece of shit the entire way through. But with that horrific scene over with, we can now continue on. But we're still not out of the woods yet. Once activated, the Dumbat wakes up and starts screaming. It seems like once again the WoW put another brain scan into something, but this time the person immediately recognized where they were and freaked out. After waking up from the destruction, Simon enters another room next door that has a device that can scan any material you put inside of it. Simon hops inside, and we discover that he is in another person's body. One thing I and Simon hadn't considered was how he got into the suit. I was just under the assumption Simon was put in the suit, but it never occurred to me how that would even be possible, but now we have the answer. The last part of what Catherine said, though, is very important, having a sound mind and a sound body. Carl would kind of be a sound mind in a not sound body. It wasn't complete. A little earlier, there was a person who was stuck to a wall just breathing. They would have a sound body, but not really a sound mind. Simon was the perfect mesh of both, which is how he can function normally, and probably why he hasn't gone insane over the course of the game, despite being in a different body. Also, those people I mentioned a second ago are actually quite relevant now that we're about to leave Data. Once we leave the room, we're being stalked by some creature. It seems to be blind, considering I was inches away from it in a brightly lit hallway and it didn't kill me. And from its design and various clues, we can piece together that this is one of the crew called Terry Akers. A few minutes ago, when I was discussing what robot to kill for the Cortex chip, in that same area, there's a room nearby that has blood and an eyeball on the floor, as well as some writing and structure gel. Terry Akers was a crew member at Delta, but due to the WoW spreading its structure gel everywhere, the Delta crew needed to relocate to Theta, but Terry wanted to stay back at Delta. However, he got a bit desperate during his isolation and ended up consuming some structure gel, either out of curiosity or because he ran out of food. This then caused him to go insane and possibly rip out his eyes, since the writing claims that he didn't need them anymore. When he eventually caved in and requested a transfer, some of the crew came to pick him up, to which he lashed out and stabbed a couple of them when they weren't looking. Terry Akers is the being that is stalking Simon here in Theta, and is also responsible for a lot of the crew's current conditions. Later, Terry ends up capturing Simon, and he sees a dream of him and Ashley again, before he comes back to reality, but now attached to the wall. This sticky substance he was stuck in is the same substance we see some of the crew attached to, which means that they're all in some simulation dreaming. And thanks to the WoW and the structure gel, they're likely going to be here indefinitely. It is technically preserving humanity as it was instructed to do, it's just not in the way anyone would actually find acceptable. Simon manages to escape Acres and enter Omicron, but something is off. All the crew's heads are gone. Well, this has to do with something called a black box. We saw one of these black boxes in a room way at the beginning of the game, but its design document says that the black boxes monitor the vital signs of the crew, but these black boxes were short-circuited by the WoW. At some point before Simon arrived, a man named Johan Ross was critically injured and was carried to Omicron since it was the nearest station. The WoW, in an attempt to preserve humanity, tried to resuscitate Ross, but nothing seemed to work. So it ended up getting quite desperate and using more electromagnetism in order to revive him, but this had the side effect of also affecting the crew's equipment, including their black boxes. The WoW managed to save Ross, but for some reason, he gained the ability of telepathy. This is how he was able to communicate with Simon whenever he appears. Using this telepathy, he was able to tell some of the crew about Alpha Sight and how to kill the WoW. It seems that the WoW had caught onto this plan as all their heads are missing, so it likely overloaded the black boxes until they exploded. In this facility is a specific container of the structure gel. Simon needs to get this gel for the power suit so he can traverse the abyss, but this structure is also modified as it acts as a sort of poison for the WoW. So Ross wants Simon to travel to Site Alpha and destroy the WoW and its hold on the facility. But one step at a time though. We need to actually get the suit first. The only one that seems operational is sitting in a nearby locker with the body inside. Pretty gross, but we can assume that they died in a similar way since their head is missing. Once Simon grabs the necessary pieces, he's ready to take the suit, but there's a problem. Since the structure gel inside Simon's suit is the only thing keeping him alive right now, he can't just climb out of the suit and put another one on. So the only option left is to do another brain scan. It's like having a picture taken. But with the most expensive camera in the world. You know, Indians thought photos would steal their souls. In this case, they'd be right. <laughs> Run 
diagnosis or something? What was that? No, I... it just... Why was it still talking? It's the same like before. Catherine, why was he still talking? That's how it works, you know that. What do you mean? You know it's not magic. You were copied. The sleeping Simon in the seat was copied, and now... You are here, just like Simon lived on in Toronto. God damn you, Kath. Two Simons? There can't be two Simons. What did you think would happen? That you were gonna take my mind and put it into another body, like a brain transplant. I'm sorry, it wouldn't work that way. You realize how messed up this is? Please, I didn't mean to upset you. How did you expect me to react to this shit? Please stop. You're fucking disgusting. What's gonna happen to him? He'll sleep for a while, a few days. And then what? Wake up in this fucking nightmare again? All alone? So cruel. Well, what do you want me to do with him? Make friends? Let him know that we have to leave him behind when we go into the abyss? What if... What if he didn't need to wake up? You do that? I don't know. Simon's not the smartest person in the world, but given how much stress his mind is under, it's understandable why he can't comprehend what's going on. We know that the brain scans are a copy, but Simon still thinks it's a transfer. That's why he's surprised when two Simons exist. But now we have three Simons. Simon 2 is now going to be left to Omicron, while Simon 3 continues down the abyss. From what we heard from their conversation, it seems like Simon is very angry and Catherine is upset because Simon yelled at her, but this ends up creating a very lonely atmosphere. Catherine is the only person that can talk to him, and losing her makes Simon and the player feel alone, and we can see this happen for a few seconds once Simon gets on the climber and heads down the abyss. This is the first time that I had felt truly alone while playing this game. Because of how the Omni tool works, Catherine can only be talked to when she's plugged into something, so when we take her with us, she can't speak. This would mean that we are technically alone, but the thought that I would eventually plug her in and talk with her again clouded my mind long enough to make me not feel alone. And it's that difference that feels so odd to me. I didn't feel alone when I was actually alone, but when I was with Catherine listening to Simon talk, even though she was right there and able to speak, I actually felt alone. It's a weird feeling. The only part of this conversation between the two that really bothered me is Simon. Seeing as they wrote him this way, I guess it's a positive, but his ability to just ignore what he sees in front of him is incredible. Simon talks about this coin toss theory of his, which is that he believes that he was lucky and ended up in the body of the suit rather than stuck in the chair like Simon too. This is something he just comes up with on the spot and it makes no sense. So even when the evidence slaps him in the face, Simon still believes that the brain scans transfer the mind, not copy them. I can see how this might be difficult for someone such as Simon who has no clue how things work in this world, but still, he can be very annoying to listen to sometimes. Before we can make it down to the bottom though, Ross interrupts our ride and says that he'll make preparations. After that interruption though, we finally make it to the bottom and head to Tau, and if you thought the ocean before was terrifying, you haven't seen the half of it. This place not only has a few corpses near the entrance, but it's incredibly dark. I'm not sure how YouTube is going to compress this video when it's uploaded, but it was extremely dark for me when I was playing. Most of what I could see was the light, and that's about it. There was the occasional object outside the cone of the flashlight that I could see, but it wasn't even worth checking out because of what goes on down here. There are quite a few deadly fish this far down in the ocean, like that anglerfish that nearly killed me, but many of the fish also seem to have been infected with structure gel thanks to the WoW. The fish here by nature hide in the shadows and hate the light, so these lights double as a guide and a safety net for the crew. At one point though, the lights disappear, so we'll have to use a robot to help guide us until it gets swept away by this giant creature. There are a couple of notes that point to this being a heavily mutated squid that has structure gel placed inside of it, but it really doesn't matter. It's large, terrifying, and just knocked out my only light source. However, through what I can only imagine is sheer luck and determination, Simon makes it out of the abyss and into Tau. Here in the Tau mess hall is a lot of rooms for the crew, but also a lot of the crew in general. Quite a few of them are being kept alive by the WoW and are suffering because of it. We can peer into their heads and listen to some of their last moments, and while most of them will be relevant in a moment, discovering one of the members of the crew was actually a really gut-wrenching moment as he's curled up on a bed holding a picture of his son. Ross's room is also in here, and we can see the pictures of how the WoW mutated with the help of the structure gel. Near the mess hall is the infirmary, and sitting in here is Sarah Lindwall, the very last human in the world. We now have the choice of killing Sarah, or let her live. We've met a few characters in similar situations, all just a couple button presses away from dying. If you killed and saved everyone, then your reasons were likely the same. But if you killed and saved people, why? What makes Robin, Amy, Sarah, and Simon 2 different? The game is subconsciously trying to ask you where you draw the line. Is Robin okay to keep alive because she believes she's on the Ark? Or because she's a robot? Or is Robin even a robot to you? Because if you thought Carl was human, then Robin has to be too. Does Amy deserve to stop suffering because she's a human? And if so, what makes her different from Robin? And in the case of Sarah and Amy, what makes them different? 
They're both human and dying, and both are being kept alive by some life support. The game wants you to figure out where and why you draw the line at certain acts, but also wants you to think about each person you've met and if either of them is truly alive or human. Soma will never answer this question for you. It's on you to do so. That means the majority of the discussion around these characters and this game is valid. Some may think that murder of any kind is wrong, so killing them is the wrong answer, but some may think the opposite. Soma doesn't want to force you into an ideal, but rather help you find your own ideals about being human and being alive, and this walking in between all this is the perfect time to do so. Walking is a mindless task, so while I was exploring, I was looking back on all the stuff I'd done up until this point and thought about whether or not my actions were the right choice. And during this entire discussion we've been having, we've been looking at Sarah slowly dying. Not only is there the choice itself, but also the consequences of the choice. You're free to leave her after unplugging the life support, but why would you? She's the last human on Earth. Why not stay a bit? The problem, though, is that both of you don't want to be here. Sarah doesn't want to wait for herself to die, and Aisha as hell didn't want to wait for her to die either. Neither you nor the person going through this want to be here. If the person could pass away immediately, that would be ideal, but instead there's those brief few minutes where time seems to slow down to a crawl, and you're just waiting for it to be over, so that the person dying no longer has to suffer, and you no longer have to stare and watch their life slowly drain from their body. This segment with Sarah is just two whole minutes of waiting. She at least lightens the mood a bit by telling a story, but it doesn't make things any better. Sitting next to Sarah is the Ark, and now we can take it to the final station, Phi, and launch it into space. I wanted to hold off on this information because, like I said, most of the game sprinkled a lot of it throughout the entire runtime, but if we recall from our first conversation with Catherine, she says that she wanted to send the Ark into space, but it never made it. Well, once we approach the final station, Phi, we can see Catherine's body and uncover what happened. Catherine was killed over a disagreement between her and Ian, the one from the interview. He believed that the Ark wouldn't survive in space because of how much debris there was out there, and he wanted to make sure it was safe before they launched it, since they only have one shot. It's a little odd, and it's still something I'm confused about because Ian clearly expressed his interest in the project, but he backs out last moment. I get where he's coming from, I know he doesn't want the Ark to be destroyed by the space debris, but who cares? It's the end of the world, and they probably won't get another chance again. The one thing I really did like about this discovery, though, is that you can actually figure this out the moment you enter Phi. On a computer is a staff list of all the crew who came and left the station. Five people all entered on December 25th, and four left the same day, with Catherine being the only one who didn't leave. Most of Soma's story has really been a show-don't-tell kind of method. The only time it deviates from this is when something important is happening, like when Simon was being copied and the game sees fit to explain what's going on. Even though we could infer what happened, it's better that the game explains it just in case people are confused because it's that important. But besides that, most of it is left for the player to uncover. It's never explained what happened at Omicron with the Headless crew unless you put all the pieces together, and I really appreciated that. It makes the discovery feel more rewarding because you're figuring it out on your own. Before we can make it to Phi though, we need to make sure the Ark gets in its casing, and to do that, we'll need to take another momentary Ross interruption, but this time it takes us to the center of the Alpha Site, where the WoW is stationed. Since Simon has the toxic structure gel from Omicron in his suit, all he has to do is push his hand inside, just like we've done numerous times before. This time though, Simon has his hand taken and bitten off by the WoW. It's still infected with a poison, so it seems like everything is still working, but Ross says that to eliminate the WoW it must remove everything it created, including us. Ross sadly isn't going to get the opportunity to do so as the giant squid comes back and saves us by eating him. Oddly enough, you don't actually have to do this. Right before you touch the WoW, you can see a yellow button by a door, and by the game's logic up until this point, that means it's an unlocked door that hasn't been opened yet. If you manage to catch that before putting your arm in the WoW, you can just walk away. Ross will obviously try to stop you, but he gets killed anyway. The only noticeable change between the two is that Simon's hand will be gone for the remainder of the game, and you'll be constantly reminded of that decision whenever you climb any ladders on the station. After placing the Ark on the space gun, Simon and Catherine now wait for the countdown to begin. Simon, of course, is worried because Catherine promised that they would do brain scans so that they can get on the Ark. Catherine, however, planned ahead and has it rigged up so that both will happen at the same time. Simon no longer has to worry and is now eager to get scanned and get on the Ark, but... Well, I think we know where this is going. Still here. Simon, I can't keep telling you how it works. You won't listen. 
You know why we're here. You were copied onto the Ark. You just didn't carry over. You lost the coin toss. We both did. Just like Simon and Omicron. Just like the man who died in Toronto a hundred years ago. This is bullshit. We came all this way. We lost the Ark. I know it sucks. But our copies are up there. Catherine and Simon are both safe on the Ark. Be happy for them. Are you crazy? We're gonna die down here with those fuckers living at large on a spaceship. They're not us. They're not us. I'm sorry you feel that way, Simon. I'm proud of what we did. We made sure that something of the hundreds of thousands of years of human history survives, that something lives on. Oh, fuck this. Fuck. Fuck this. Fuck you. Fuck you, Catherine. You lied. And I believed in you. I trusted you. You said we're getting on the fucking Ark. We are on the Ark, you idiot. I didn't lie. I can't be responsible for your goddamn ignorance. You fucking... Fuck! Catherine? Please don't leave me alone. Catherine? Catherine? Obviously, it still hasn't clicked for Simon that he was going to be copied and not transferred. Catherine has tried to explain this to him numerous times, and he still didn't get it. She even tried to make Simon understand by explaining it with the coin toss method that he came up with, but as we know, that's not even a real thing. She just tried to explain it in a way that would make sense to him, since his ignorance has reached levels I have never seen achieved before, but he still doesn't get it. Say what you will about Simon and his intelligence, it's hard not to feel bad about his current situation. He's trapped at the bottom of the ocean with all the lights and power off. There doesn't seem to be a way for him to leave the facility since everything is off. So Simon is going to have to find a way to kill himself if he wants to escape this nightmare. It's almost ironic in a way if you ended up actually saving Simon 2 earlier because you as Simon 3 kept Simon 2 alive at Omicron and now the game is forcing Simon 3 to be stuck here with him. Speaking of Simon 2, you might be wondering what happened to our choices. And to that I say, who cares? It's over. That's not a joke or anything, that's pretty much what the game says. None of the people we killed or saved changed anything. The only meaningful change in this game was the WoW, and that's only because you have to stare at your lost arm for an hour if you wanted to kill it. Destroying the WoW or not doesn't change anything. Killing Simon 2, Amy, Robin, and Sarah changed nothing. So many games give the player a consequence for their choices. Soma's only consequence is an arm. The Earth is gone, and humanity is dead, so what would be the consequences of our choices? None of them are going to see that arc, but that doesn't mean we can't. We briefly take control of Simon 4, and he believes he won. Catherine knows better, but won't say anything. Simon 4 has no idea that Simon 3 is still down there in the bottom of the ocean. If that's confusing, allow me to provide an example. Copying or cloning yourself means that you and your clone are the exact same person up until the clone was created. So if you knew what 2 plus 2 was before the scan, the clone would know 2. But if you didn't know what that was and only learned it after creating the clone, only you would know that information, since it was after the clone was created. Simon's brain was scanned before he realized he was only going to be copied and not transferred, and since this new Simon, Simon 4, is the same as Simon 3 sitting in the chair at that exact moment, he doesn't know Simon 3 exists and believes he won the coin toss. That's kind of horrifying if you think about it, and I doubt Catherine would have told Simon 4 what happened or he would have gone insane knowing he just doomed his older self. The best part about the arc, though, is that the survey returns. The survey is easily one of the best placed devices in this game. The first is placed right when the player learns the truth about the world, and the second is after the player learns the truth about the game. This survey was never for Simon or the people of the arc. It was just made that way so that it fits in with the lore. This survey is actually for the player. In both surveys, I try to answer as honestly as I could. In the first one, I was hopeful, optimistic. I was obviously in a scary, dark place, but there was still hope. I was with Simon and Catherine and we were going to save the Ark, but now that I'm on the Ark, I wasn't happy. I left Simon behind and I couldn't accept that. Yeah, Simon 4 is still Simon 3, but that's not my Simon. Even though Simon 3 and 4 are literally the same person, Simon 4 felt alien to me. Because they're two different people, it felt like I had two different relationships with them. And that's the weird part. Simon 3 and 4 are the same person, so I shouldn't feel sad. The example I used earlier translates to this. Simon 3 copied himself and made Simon 4, which means that Simon 4 went through everything the others did, but just went a little bit further. So because of this, I really shouldn't feel bad, because Simon made it, I got him on the Ark, but this Simon feels different to me. I grew a connection with the Simon 2 and 3, not Simon 4, despite technically being him since the start of the game. Even though I had succeeded, I still couldn't help but feel like I betrayed Simon, and at the last moment, instead of staying behind, I went on the Ark without him. So when I answered the survey, I felt sad. I wanted Simon 3 here with me, not Simon 4. But at the end of the survey, it asks, would you rather be removed from the project and accept death? I answered no. 
Even though Simon 3 was left behind, I wasn't going to join him. Is that selfish of me? Probably, but I'm human. Even though Simon 3 lost, I won. Is that greedy of me? Probably, but I'm human. Soma brings out all the human emotions that we have and never does anything with them, just lets us sit with them and let us ask the questions ourselves. So no, I don't want to die. I want to be in the Ark. Even if that means I leave Simon 3 behind, because on the Ark, I'm alive. And being alive is a part of being human. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to leave a like. If you're watching this on release, then just a reminder, this is the first video I plan to make for our October horror-themed month. If you want to know more about it, though, check out the community tab here on the channel. Regardless, I hope you enjoyed Soma, because I sure did. Like the video if you enjoyed, and subscribe if you're new. As always, thank you to my returning viewers for coming back to another video, and take care, everyone. Goodbye.